Hello my dears and welcome back to my channel and welcome back to our first official knit along video where we will be making Trimmed with Roses from A Stitch in Time Volume 2 by Susan Crawford. Well, welcome back, my dears. I am very, very excited for today's episode, I guess it would be called. Um, I finally got all of the yarn in from uh, Shetland and I immediately, of course, took it out and gave it like a good like squeeze and uh, a nice smell. It has that wonderful raw wool smell to it. That's just absolutely lovely. Um, and made sure that I had all of the other items that I needed. And so we will be going over that today. If you're gonna be following along for this particular cardigan, you'll wanna make sure you have all of these things in order before you get started to make sure you're ready to go. If you are working on a knit along project with us here, but you're choosing a different cardigan or jumper for yourself, of course, do the same, go through your pattern and make sure you have everything that you need. Now for this particular pattern, we are gonna need a main color in jumper weight yarn. This is from Jameson and Smith, and this is Shetland wool. This is in the color of fawn. Now you'll notice I have a great big cone of yarn. Now for this particular pattern, it's saying that for the size I'm going to be knitting up, which is the first size, that we will need 12 balls of yarn. After I did the math and looked at everything online, I found that getting a cone was going to be more economical. It was less expensive to get a full cone versus getting a bunch of small or balls of yarn. And the other wonderful thing about getting the cone when doing this is that I'm not gonna have a bunch of little ends to weave in. Now, of course, around the motif that we have, we will definitely have ends that we need to weave in, but for the main body of the cardigan or the main body of the jumper if you're making it, this is a really nice option to avoid having all of those little ends that you need to weave in. And of course, more economical, a little bit less money. Less money spent on yarn means more money spent on other fun goodies. The next thing I did was I did get a couple of small balls of yarn. These are gonna be for our motif. Now the main body of the sweater, I chose to use the exact color, the fawn that was recommended in the pattern that Susan Crawford has written in the book. I think it's really beautiful. Unfortunately, when I went in to get the colors, the color numbers that associate it with it that are written down in the book were not in the website. So I couldn't find the exact colors that had been used. And I'm sure it's simply because this book was written a few years ago now and the colors year to year in some of the dye lots probably do change. I did go ahead and do my best to get close because I like the look of the original sweater in the book. And while of course, anytime you're making a sweater from a book, you can always change the colors to fit what you're loving most. I think for the roses, this is a really lovely combination. Now with that being said, I did order two additional colors because I wasn't sure how things were going to come out. Sometimes the way they look on the computer versus how they look in person can be a little bit different. And I did leave the other pink in the other room, but you can see I ordered a darker green and I added a darker pink as well, just to make sure that my colors were gonna be exactly what I wanted. The other pink that I ordered was a bit too fuchsia for me, for my opinion, and this darker green ended up really being a little bit too dark. So I was happy I ordered myself two spares because this had been my first choice. And if I hadn't gotten this lighter green as a backup, I may have been a little bit disappointed. Now, of course, that did mean I spent a little bit of extra money, but I know I will get really good use out of this darker green and out of that fuchsia wool as well, so I'm not terribly worried about it. So I have the colors for my, my motif and I have them ready to go. They are also in that jumper weight, so the main body and of course the motif are gonna line up. They're gonna go perfectly together. Now finally, I do have the knit, knitting needles that they recommended for this in size 275 and 325. So 275 for our cast on and our ribbing, 375 for the main body of the sweater. So what did I do? What else have I done since I got this all in the mail? I took the first step forward and I went ahead and knit a test 
swatch. Now you'll notice my test swatch looks kind of wonky here. This top portion is a little bit smaller, a little bit tighter. The bottom portion is a little bit wider, a little bit softer, and that's on purpose. I recently learned, despite the fact that I've been knitting for a little while, that something you can do to help you on your way with a project when you're doing your test swatches is to do one big test swatch instead of doing multiple small test swatches. I picked that little tip up from This Is Knit. I will link them in the description below. I follow them on Instagram and I think that their shop in Ireland is really phenomenal. And the women who own that store and who work there are phenomenal. They know so much about knitting and they share knowledge on Instagram, including little tips like doing one swatch instead of doing multiple smaller swatches. There's a few reasons that you wanna do this. One, it's time saving, right? You're just knitting all the way through. You're starting with one and going to the next. The other is you can see how the two stitches are going to play against each other because when you're knitting your sweater, you're going to be doing them one right after the other. So this is a lovely idea. So on the top here, I have the smaller, the two seven fives for the needles. And I went ahead and did a rib stitching that we will do along the bottom. And then I also did a standard knit knit stitch. And then on the bottom, I did another ribbing with the three to five needles or the size three US. The top is size two US and I can go ahead and see that there. Now, when I'm going through to do the counts to make sure that my tension is correct for the sweater to ensure that I have the correct number of stitches, I only have one piece of fabric that I need to keep track of and I can see how the stitches really look next to one another. And I will show you guys a close up of this here. So when I'm looking at this, you can actually see how tight the stitches are with the size two needles, the uh, 275, and how much softer they are with the 325. Now, it's the size of the needles isn't dramatic, but the drape of the fabric is going to be as that softer stitch is going to be through the body and it's going to create nice drape. Whereas you can even feel it when we're feeling this fabric, how much tighter these small stitches create a more dense fabric. So here I can just take my needles, I can count out my stitches and make sure that my gauge for the sweater is on point. The other thing to consider when doing a test swatch is the type of yarn that you're using and how it's going to be impactful. Knitting up a test swatch isn't just about just knitting it up and then throwing it flat. You need to wash it out. You need to block it and dry it so that you can see how it will really be in a finished garment. And in particular, that's important if you do decide to go with a cone, um, because a lot of times these cones, according to Shetland or um, Jameson and Smith, they, these have an oil on them from the machines, which they purposefully do, and that helps them go onto the cone nicer. It keeps everything nice and tight for you. So when you wash it, that oil is gonna be released. It's gonna come off of the material. And then when you block it out, it's going to look different and feel different. And it certainly does. This, because of the oil being on it, is really tight, rope-like almost. And then once it's washed and blocked, it becomes really fuzzy, really soft, and it creates a really nice fabric here for you. So I, this is knit. Thank you for this amazing tip. And I will be uh, continuing to follow along and probably continuing to reference this is knit as we go through this, because they have a lot of wonderful tips and tricks for people who are knitting up garments and for the time, the first um, garment that you're knitting. So we've got that test swatch done there. We've got all of our yarn in place and it's time to cast on our project. Now, according to Susan Crawford and in the beginning of the book, A Stitch in Time, volume two, she goes over the basics for what you'll need in order to recreate the garments that she has in this book, including things like how you cast on, what methods they used, how you cast off, how you increase or decrease to utilize shaping and so forth. And so looking at her instructions at the beginning of the book and for casting on, she states that unless otherwise stated in the pattern, she uses a cable cast on or in certain rib knit stitches in alternate cable cast on. 
She also indicates that if you prefer, you can use a long tail cast on method with your smaller needles as indicated in the pattern. She indicates that the best thing to do, of course, is to do what you're comfortable with, um, but lets you know that predominantly she does use that cable cast on method. I have historically used long tail cast on predominantly. That is something that I feel most comfortable with because it was one of the first things that I learned. However, because I do want everyone to feel comfortable if you are following along, we will go ahead and do a quick review of how to do a cable cast on, an alternate cable cast on, and a long tail cast on. So let's go ahead and take a quick review of that here. All right, here we are. This is our size 2 US or a 275, and this is our jumper weight yarn. You can see these are quite small, and so what I'm going to do is set these aside for now, and we're going to review the cast on techniques with something that's a little bit larger and on some slightly larger needles here in order to help show you exactly what's happening a little bit more clearly. All right, so for a cable cast on. There are a couple of reasons that a cable cast on can be really nice for you. One of the big reasons that it can be great is that you don't have to worry about wasted yarn at the end. With a long tail cast on, of course, you're going to be pulling lots and lots of tail in order to create it. And if you don't get it quite right, you may have to pull all the stitches out to cast back on again. Or if you have way too much in your tail, of course, you're gonna have all of that additional yarn that you either need to weave in or simply cut off. So with a cable cast on, one of the things that happens to be a benefit is that you really don't have too much guessing. You only need to leave yourself enough of a tail to go ahead and weave that end in. For a standard cable cast on, we are gonna go ahead and just do a standard slip knot. And like I said, we don't really have to have a long tail here. And then we're going to go ahead and place that stitch onto the needle that we're going to be holding in our left hand. And for the very first cast on stitch here, we actually are going to do a knit cast on stitch because the cabling needs at least two stitches in order to happen. So for our first stitch, we're going to go ahead and come up in this loop. Here we can see we've got the two needles through and we're going to go around, knit, and now that we're here, we're gonna twist and place that stitch right on. Okay, so now we've got two stitches. And now that we have two stitches here, now we can start our cable. You can see the bottom portion and here's the top. And this is gonna be important for the cable stitch, cable cast on. What you're gonna do is instead of coming through this stitch like you would for a knit stitch, we're gonna be coming through between the two stitches. Okay. And now we're going to take that working yarn up and over, pull that stitch through, give it that twist, and place that stitch right onto your needle. Next cable cast on, go between the two stitches. Make sure you grab your working yarn. There you go, up and over the top, pull the stitch through, give it a little twist place that stitch onto your needle. Let's watch that a couple of more times to make sure we've got the hang of the cable cast on. Coming between the two stitches, cast on, pull through, and twist. Work that needle between the two stitches. Okay. Give it a little twist. Come in. And this is kind of a toughie about cable cast on. You have to kind of push to get between those two stitches sometimes. Get that through, up and over, twist, and cast on. Okay. And now when you've done this, you can see, let me see, make sure I can get this in here for you. How that creates kind of uh, it's almost like a twist here at the end that's the edge that you'll have with your cable cast on okay so that is our 
cable cast on method, which Susan Crawford states is her predominant cast on method for this book. Now we are gonna be doing a cardigan here that has a rib knit at the end. And so one of the other options is to go ahead and do an alternate cable cast on. So we're gonna start with our yarn and our needles again. And once again, because it is a cable cast on, even though it's an alternate, you can start with that smaller tail here to prevent waste. Okay. Place our needle through. First stitch is a knit stitch. Pull that through, give it a little twist, pop that on. I now have my two stitches to start. This was a knit stitch. We went in um, working through the front of the yarn to the back of the yarn. So for an alternate cable cast on, instead of going between these two stitches here, we're gonna be coming through the back, but we are still going between the two stitches. Now we're going to go ahead and loop around like we're gonna purl, pull through the back and give it a little twist and pop that on, okay? Now I've got my three stitches. My previous stitch was a purl stitch, so now I'm gonna go ahead and go through these front two stitches again for a knit stitch. Here we go. Okay, I'm gonna be taking my yarn back to the back of my work, up and over. Pull that stitch through, give it a little twist, and put that on. So here we go, we've got a knit, we've got our cast on, a knit, a purl, and a knit. So the next stitch we have will be a purl. So coming from the back of the work between the two stitches, bringing the working yarn forward, up and over, pull that work through the back, give it a little twist, and put that on. Now if you ever have to stop in the middle of casting on your stitches here and you forget where you've left off, one way you can tell is when you're looking at your cast on here, you're gonna notice that on this purl stitch, it looks like my yarn is coming out behind my stitches. Can we see that here? See how it's behind? Now, if we are doing a knit stitch, and we'll show you that here, Go ahead and work that stitch through. Give it a little twist. Now my yarn is coming out of that front stitch. It's no longer falling two stitches behind. All right, so let's go ahead and do that alternate cable cast on for a few more stitches just to make sure we've got the hang of it. Purl stitch coming through the back of the work. up and over, bring it forward, little twist, placing that onto the needle. The next one is our knit stitch coming through the front of the work, bringing the working yarn to the back, up and over, work that stitch through, give it a little twist, place it onto the needle, then coming through the back, bringing the working yarn forward, up and over, pulling that work through the back, and a little twist. All right, so we can see we've got quite a few stitches on here. And you can already kind of see how, when you're working that stitch, it's bunching up. So when you do your rib stitching, the purl stitches are going to naturally be pulled back. The knit stitches are going to naturally come forward and your material is going to almost be rounded around your stitches. Okay. And that is the alternate cable cast on. Now the final cast on that is mentioned at the beginning of the book is the long tail cast on. Now, I like long tail cast on because I find it to be a nice stretchy cast on. 
and I feel it is a very quick and very easy cast on. However, it does occasionally end in heartbreak if you have a very large number of stitches that you need to cast on. If you don't give yourself a long enough tail, you may find yourself pulling it all right back out and starting over. Or if you give yourself too much of a tail, of course, you may be wasting yarn. But we're going to go through it because it is probably the fastest and the easiest and probably the most stretchy of the three cast on methods. So cable cast on and alternate cable cast on are go both going to be uh, more economical. You're not going to accidentally have too much uh, long tail, of course. You're going to create that long tail at the end. So in every single one of these cast on methods, we are going to start out with that slip knot. We're going to twist the yarn, bring it up through the center, pull tight, and then we can go ahead and pull that down nice and tight. Now for a long tail cast on, instead of working with two needles, we only need to start with one of our needles. So I have my initial stitch on, and now what I'm going to do is create this V. So I bring the material down, or the two pieces of yarn down, and then I'm gonna come in between them with my pointer finger and my thumb, and create this little triangle here. And now to create my stitches, I am going to be rotating my hands. So from here, we're gonna come down. Some of you might recognize this from school, from playing with yarn doing Cat's Cradle create my thing, come down, okay? And now I'm gonna come under this yarn here that's by the thumb, wrap around and grab the yarn at the front of my finger, okay? Then drop the thumb, pull tight. And now we have two stitches, so let's watch that again. I have my triangle, I'm going to pull it down. I have the working yarn at the front of the thumb, but I'm gonna to go to the yarn that's being held behind, okay? Coming over to the front yarn or the yarn at the front of the finger, snag that and pull it through, drop the stitch on the thumb, use your thumb to go ahead and pull that stitch tight. Back of the thumb, front of the finger, pull that stitch through, and pull it tight. Okay, let's watch it a few more times and I'll continue to go slow. I have my yarn, the two pieces being held down here by these two fingers. I have the triangle that I'm creating here and pulling down. Go under the thumb, over the finger, and I'm pulling through. I don't know if you guys can see, it's going through these two pieces of yarn from the thumb. Then I drop the thumb and pull tight. Under, over, through, pull tight. Under, over, through, pull tight. And you can see with this, because you're not utilizing another needle that needs to go through, this can be done very, very quickly. We've been doing it slowly, but we can easily just pop those stitches on fairly rapidly. And this is, I think, one of the reasons that this is a very popular cast on method, especially for new knitters, because it is extremely easy. Now with this particular cast on, and we'll see if we can get it in the camera here, it creates like a braided cast on. And it will be more of a square cast on at the bottom than the traditional cable cast on, which will have a rounded corner. Um, so this will have a more squared off corner at where your starting point is. With the alternate cable cast on, it's going to create a better square because you're gonna be having the stitches match up so nicely. Now with a long tail cast on, um, yes, one of the the shames is sometimes you do have waste here at the end. Um, the other thing is that just like with a cable cast on, when you are doing a rib stitch, 
this bottom portion here isn't going to melt into the material. So you are gonna have kind of a slightly flared bottom edge. It's not gonna be huge or terribly noticeable, but it will be there. The one, the cast on method in particular that will have a, the cleanest, tightest look to it, of course, will be the alternate cable because it will be lining up with your rib knit stitching that you will be doing. So there are the three methods of cast on, cable cast on, alternate cable cast on, and here last is our long tail cast on. All right, my dears, now that we have our stitches cast on, I've got 53 stitches cast on here, as is indicated in the pattern for trimmed with roses for myself. Now it's time to begin the rib stitching here. Now I am traditionally an English or an American style knitter, and so I tend to hold the yarn in my dominant hand, which for me is my right hand, and then I hold the opposite end of my needles with my left. Now, if you are a continental knitter, of course, you'll go ahead and throw that yarn over into your left hand to stabilize that yarn. Let's go ahead and show how to do that rib stitching. I'll show you both English or American style, and then I will attempt to show you continental. And I will go ahead and preface it with, I predominantly only do stitch stitch in continental. I'm not as adept at doing rib stitching with it. However, if you are wanting to try continental out, it is something that once you get the hang of it, it can be very quick because you're not adding an additional movement with your hands. That being said, if you are most familiar and most comfortable with English style knitting, throwing, or American style knitting, um, of course, stick with what you're most comfortable with because you're going to get the most consistent garment at the end if you do stick with one method or the other. So let's go ahead and look at the basic um, purl stitch and the best basic knit stitch to create our ribbing, first in English or American style and second in continental. All right, here we are once again with our thicker needles and our thicker yarn to work on our rib knit stitching. Now for a basic rib knit, it is a knit stitch, a purl stitch, knit stitch, purl stitch. Now, of course, if you are doing a different pattern, go ahead and refer to what's in the pattern. Sometimes in your ribbing, it's gonna be a one by one ribbing, which means it will be a knit, purl, knit, purl. If it is a two by two, it will be two knits, two purls, two knits, two purls, three by three, and so on and so forth. So for this, if you are um, newer and you're knitting along, but maybe you're just trying to learn these methods to do a scarf or something, that would be great. Here, we're gonna try that rib stitch. Now, the great thing about a rib stitch, of course, is that it's going to create a nice flat material, which we can see here. Now, if I had just knit this all the way up, the material would have rolled. So the rib stitching, of course, allows the material to lay nice and flat. It also gives the material a nice stretchy base. Let me make sure we're in camera here. Stretchy base, which in particular, when you're doing garments, hats, sweaters, cuffs of sleeves, etc., you want that stretchiness um, in order to go up over heads, hips, and arms. So for this, we'll go ahead and show a knit stitch. First, knit stitches are always going to be worked through the front of your um, line of stitches and purl stitches will be worked through the back. When you are working with your yarn, your working yarn for a knit stitch, the working yarn is in the back. And it, with a purl stitch, the working yarn is in the front. So it's just opposite of where you're working through. So we're working through the front to the back with our working yarn in the back. up and over, and that's a knit stitch. And that is in a traditional English style. I am holding the working yarn you can see here in my right hand. Okay, now for my next stitch, I'm gonna do a purl stitch. So instead of working front to back, I'm gonna be working back to front. So I'm gonna pick up that stitch through the back first. Sorry, let's get this held out of our way. First, I need to bring my working yarn forward pick up that stitch through the back and up and over and that's going to create my purl stitch. Pull it and go ahead and drop it off. Move my working yarn back to the back again. 
coming through front to back will be my knit stitch up and over, pull that through and drop the stitch off the end. Pull that yarn forward, work back to front for my purl stitch and pull that stitch off. Move my working yarn to the back, working front to back for the knit stitch. Okay, so let's do a couple of those. We'll do them in fast sequence, and then I'll show you what that material looks like. Right, we're at the end of our row. I can, we can already begin to see our work. We can see those knit stitches popping forward here. And on the back side here, we can see our purl stitches popping forward. Okay, so then when we turn our work for our ribbing, one of the most important things, of course, is that you are matching your stitches. If you do a purl stitch into a knit stitch or vice versa, the material that you make will be in seed stitch. So we want to maintain that ribbing. So the last stitch I did was a knit stitch. So through that knit stitch, I need to do a purl on the back side so that it will match. Okay. Moving my working yarn to the back to create a knit stitch. And I can tell what stitch is coming next by looking at it. If I have this bar here, this is going to be a purl stitch, okay? So I already know that coming up if I were to lose my place. I'm looking for that bar. Now when I look at a knit stitch, you can see I have a loop, okay, versus a bar. There's the bar, here's the loop. So I know this is going to be a knit stitch. All right, we are at the end of our row. And again, like I said, you can begin to see on whichever side you're looking at, you can see those stitches coming forward, those knit stitches coming forward. Okay, and this is how the bottom is going to look in that long tail cast on. And it's gonna maintain a nice stretch here, nice and stretchy. Okay, and that has all been English style or American style. Sometimes it's called throwing. Now, if you are a continental knitter or you're wanting to learn continental, you're gonna take, and take your working yarn and move it back to your left hand. Okay. And you're gonna hold the yarn up in the front here. They do also have rings and so forth to help with tension, tension rings that can be very helpful when you're learning continental. But here, we'll kind of go over a few stitches. I'll be very slow and I apologize. So for a knit stitch, I'm gonna come through and I'm going to grab that yarn and come through. And now because I have this in this left hand. I don't have to do anything extra. I can simply move my hand forward for the purl stitch. And I'm going to grab that yarn and pull it through and then move my work back. So knit and purl. Knit and purl. And you can see how if you practice this particular style, it can get very fast, especially when you're doing ribbing because you're not having to pull that yarn in, out, and back, and front. It really can be quite quick if 
you practice at it. I am simply not terribly practiced at it because I was taught English style when I first learned how to knit. Okay. And you can see that one of the differences is they sometimes call continental picking. So English style is sometimes called throwing. You're throwing the yarn up and over and then continental can be called picking because you're going to pick that yarn. Okay. So there was our rib ribbing one by one, both in English and in Continental. And you can see the end result is exactly the same for both. They both create a perfect purl and a perfect knit stitch. They both work really nicely. It just depends on what you are most comfortable with and what you feel you can get your tension correct with, whether that's throwing or picking, whether that's English, American or Continental. Now, I did choose to do a long tail cast on when I did this particular test swatch. And I do wanna go ahead and just show everybody what that would look like in a jumper weight yarn. And that to let you see that that's gonna be nice and stretchy. It's definitely gonna go with the material really nicely. That's not a problem at all. This was my cast on itch. This is my cast off edge and you can see my cast off is quite a bit tighter. I did a standard two stitch bind off here. We will go over other bind off methods in the future when we get to that point on the sweater, but for a cast on this was the long tail here. All right, my Mama. dears, now that we have got things underway with our rib stitching, we're going to continue in this fashion through the bottom portion. And in this particular sweater, we'll be doing three and a half inches for that base section before we transition to our larger needles and go into the body of our work, which is where we will meet up in our next video. Thank you guys so much for joining me today on our knit along. I hope that you enjoyed this video and I hope to see you all back again for our second video at the end of next month where we will transition from working our rib stitching into our stitch stitch for the body of our beautiful cardigan from A Stitch in Time, Volume 2. Thank you guys so much. Bye.